Well, Dan, thanks for taking time to talk to our church a little bit about the life of a military chaplain. Um, I would love for you to share a little bit about your journey. How did you choose to become an Air Force chaplain, and what was that process like for you? Well, I, I think for me, um, first of all, let me say hi to all the people in Southern California, beautiful, sunny Southern California. Um, but um, uh, right now, it's just sunny in New Jersey where we're at. But uh, anyways, for me, uh, chaplaincy was always something that I was interested in all the way back in, in college. It was something that I was thinking about doing. Um, but didn't have the clear desire, the clear calling um, to be in chaplaincy. And, um, but it was always there in the back of my mind. And uh, we moved out to Southern California in 2008 and started a church uh, in the in Riverside County area. And uh, through a series of circumstances, uh, this is when we were introduced to Caris Fellowship and um, our church needed space, and there was a Karis church uh, that that needed uh, some revitalization, and so we went through a merger process. And uh, as we finished up that merger, that took took probably about three years. Um, uh, we came to a conclusion at the end of it that the that our heart was uh, at that at that stage not there in that ministry anymore. And the Lord, we had done what the Lord had called us to do, and so in. 2017 um, God made it really abundantly clear that he was calling us to the unique culture of military ministry because it is unique it is a culture in and of itself and so that that was just where our heart was we were interested in ministering to those in the military yeah so what's ministry look like for someone who's who's serving as a military chaplain what do you do during the day so, yeah, it's very diverse. So, you know, when everybody explains chaplaincy, I think they explain it this way. There is two sides. There's the officer side, which is like the military side, and then the chaplain side, which is like the pastoral side. And so much of the day oftentimes is filled with officer duties. This is anything from sitting through meetings where you're, you know, hearing about the pace of operations and where jets are going and who's coming in and out of your base uh, to putting on a, uh, a resiliency event for a base community, um, advising leaders, sitting down with leaders and talking to them about maybe uh, unit morale and those type of things. And then there's the pastoral side. And the pastoral side is really very close to typical ministry. Um, you're, you're, you're visiting people um, in their units, uh, you're praying with people, you're hosting Bible studies, you're preaching, um, doing all those different, different things that we do, whether it's an incarnational type of ministry uh, or whether it's a proclamation of the gospel um, on a Sunday morning. Yeah. One of our pastors, uh, Don Shoemaker, is a uh, police chaplain here in Seal Beach. He talks about doing ride-alongs in police cars sometimes. You're, you're with the Air Force. What does a ride-along look like for, a, for an Air Force? Yeah, a little, little higher up. So uh, I get a reg regular opportunity uh, to uh, jump on jets and go with flight crews. Um, and lucky right now, my leadership uh, is very, very pro about me getting on and, and flying with some of the flight crews over, overseas on different missions that they're on and really, really wants me there with them. And so you fly with them, you sleep with them, you show up and, and um, you get mixed you know, mixed responses. Some are really surprised. They never had chaplains do that. Some are, are have had chaplains do that in the past. They're very thankful. Um, they understand why you're there, even if they are not religious or, or a Christian in any sense, they still really appreciate the fact that you're there supporting them and really looking out for them. And so you get to do that pretty often. And, you know, also it's just kind of the humdrum stuff. It's, it's, um, being with what they call port dogs and loading loading jets pushing cargo onto jets with the airmen and talking to them during that time um, it's um, sitting in a in a flight tower and listening to them uh, you know talk back and forth to flight crews or uh, walking around talking to maintainers and the different things they do or being out on a frozen flight line I, I can think back of you know being out and delivering hot cocoa on a freezing flight line in New Jersey at, you know, 6 p.m. at night or whatever, 
And so uh, some of it's a lot of your ministry is, is, is cool stuff like that. I think it's cool stuff like that. I, I love doing those things. And that's kind of a ride along um, for us. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I didn't ask you this question ahead of time. So I've kind of sprung this on you, but you know, military ministry is kind of similar to, to college ministry in some ways, because you're interacting with so many 18 to 25 year olds. Um, what are some of the questions that a lot of the, the airmen are asking that you're experiencing? Like what, what are some of the, the doubts or struggles or where, where is, um, where's their gospel opportunity? Where is their sort of thorns in their, in their life? Yeah. So I think, the big thing that every ministry face and it's definitely in the air force is a big question is how do we engage that, that 18 to 25 year old group? Because many of them are um, not necessarily anti-religious, but they're not religious or necessarily do they understand faith? They, they uh, many of them grew up just completely disconnected from any type of church experience, or if they did um, they've wandered from it, in their time right after basic training. You know, everybody goes to chapel at basic training. Once that's over, then, then they stop going. And so um, there's a few things that I've discovered. One, um, well, I, I back it up saying um, we get the cool opportunity. I get the cool opportunity of being over dorm ministry. And so one of the things we do is dorm dinners. We'll have about 100 uh, people come every Thursday evening. Not right now, but before. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first Thursday of every month. Sorry, we have a home-cooked meal. We get to spend a lot of time with them. In our conversations with them, a few things that we've discovered is, one, is that they are interested in spiritual things. It's not that they are not interested in what's happening in a church or this Jesus guy. Um, They are interested. Um, uh, They just don't really know where to start in that conversation. Um, Two is they um, like to discuss the hard questions. They like to discuss kind of uh, maybe things that, uh, if you grew up in the church, you don't necessarily think about, but just general objections to to God, like what do you do about evolution? How can a loving God allow bad things to happen to good people? You know, these type of questions that maybe you don't think of when, uh, you know, if you grew up in the church, but for them, these are questions that they have kind of from an outsider's eye, eyes in. And so I think I've learned to embrace those questions and, and just al- allow them to, 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 um, to, to ask them and not feel threatened by their doubts, um, but to instead just uh, kind of talk through those things with them. And um, it's amazing that they're open and, and, you, and you can have effective ministry and see some of them come to Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes longer than maybe it would have in, in, in the past. Yeah. Well, um, we have a, a number of younger adults in our church who are thinking about questions of calling, thinking about what they want to do with their lives. Um, would you speak to those young leaders about why would they want to consider being a military chaplain? What would make someone a good chaplain in the military? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, don't do it if you just think the uniforms are cool. If that's <laughs> your calling, don't, you know, it's much deeper than that. You've got to have a calling um to it specifically and um that was one of the big things i have a buddy who's an army chaplain and that was the first thing he told me he's like you better be called to this and um it, and it is very true um make sure that that is a desire that god is putting in your heart um but if it is then you have an awesome calling being placed upon you and um you know, uh, it is a great opportunity um, to minister because you are literally overwhelmed with people um, and with opportunity. Um, I, you know, we counsel, I, I, I don't know, this is a slower counseling base where I'm at, and I counsel typically, um, I want to say around 14 to 20 hours a month, somewhere in that range. And in some of the higher counseling bases, you're counseling close to uh, 30 hours a month where you're sitting down having one-on-one conversations with people going through some of the hardest moments in their life. And the opportunity to bring Christ to bear to their problems as an answer to their problems is, is such a privilege. And so, 
Um, evangelistically, it is a great opportunity. Um, and of course, experientially, it's, it's a great opportunity too. You know, I think a special niche for younger um, people that are maybe not 100% sure about active duty or not is um, a reserve capacity or working in a capacity of uh, the chapel, chaplain candidacy program. The chaplain candidacy program is something that you can do while you complete your Master of Divinity. Um, they will, as far as the Air Force goes, I can't speak for all the branches, you get to travel around and see all the different uh, missions and different types of bases from the Air Force Academy to Nellis Air Force Base to all kinds of different bases and see what they do. And uh, you get an experience to kind of stick your toes in the water, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so if you think you're called to that and you should be called, if you think you're called to that, understand you're being called to a specific type of culture um, because it will change, it will be different. And uh, there will be sacrifices that come with it, whether it be deployments or uh, just high stress upon you and upon your family. And so be aware of those things. Um, but uh, it's a great, great experience and great opportunity. And I would encourage you, you know, reach out to me, reach out to, Eagle, uh, to the Eagle Commission and just have that conversation with people. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. it'll be a big blessing and help. Yeah. And if people don't know, you, you mentioned you, you have to have a master's in divinity degree from a seminary, from an accredited seminary, and you have to be ordained with a sponsoring uh, denomination, which are our fellowship of churches. You mentioned Caris Fellowship is, is one of the ones that the Department of Defense recognizes. Correct. Well, um, you are an ordained minister, not just of our fellowship, but actually of our church. You're a member of our, our church as well. So as a member, how can we support you? How can we pray for you and your family? And how can we encourage you in the, the work that, that you're doing? Well, of course, uh, just praying for uh, endurance um, for myself and my wife. Um, just pray that God's blessing will be upon our, our career. Uh, and I say that not because I just want to promote and, and move up the rank or whatever. I say that because I, wanna, I want to be able to be effective in what we do. And so just praying that God will send us to the right assignments where the Lord is going to bless and we're going to be a help to those that we minister to uh, would be my number one prayer request. If you can remember that, you'll be doing a lot. Um, I would say additionally also thank you, thank you, thank you to the congregation for um, your care and love that you sent our way this pa the past uh, Christmas season. That was greatly appreciated and a huge blessing to our family. Um, um, I think if you guys are doing those things, um, then you're, you're doing more than I could expect and would be very thankful. Right. Well, anything else you'd want to say to, to our church? Um, don't take Southern California for granted. <laughs> <laughs> Complain about the traffic, but enjoy everything else because it is a great place compared to New Jersey. I will tell you that. Well, that's why they send you on flights over to Greenland, right? Just so you appreciate New Jersey more. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, probably. All right. Well, thanks, Dan. I appreciate the time. All right. Take care and blessings. Okay.